So at this point, you've either got your virtual device running or your real device. You need to set that up at the beginning of each day so that we're ready to, to, to work. And so what we're going to do here then is I'm going to uh, remind you that in the network folder, I'm going to put a copy of my work from the end of the previous day. At the end of the day, I'm going to put it into the network folder. So if you want a copy of my work from last time, you can look inside of Campus Android 2. And now our project will be my SDCE with the date. We had this template file. I suppose let me get rid of that temp one right there. Uh, so we had these template files um, on the 3rd and then on the 8th. And then after that, we took the template and then turned it into the actual real my SDCE project, which is the thing that we're going toward completing at the end of this course. The unofficial continuing education app for the college. Mine from last week, Thursday, is right there if you want a copy of that copy that to your flash drive or continue to work on yours. But I will assume that I've got one on my flash drive. I will assume you've got one on your flash drive. And what we're going to do is this. We've got this project set up. It's got the phone gap, it's got the TACO, the Cordova framework, and um, we imported our app from last month, our website from last month, and we brought it in. And what we, well, some of the last things that we did with this, that we played with, were to be able to open external links. Uh, so that was the in-app browser that allowed you to open the college's website, or in, the la in our case, the very last thing that we did was a YouTube link. That was our in app browser plugin. We're going to explore some more plugins. Not all of these plugins will be useful for every kind of project, of course, but you can think about it in these terms about what would I like my app to do and how can I accomplish it. Sometimes people ask me, I'd like to make an app that you can scan barcodes and create a database. We can do that. There is a plugin that lets us do that. Sometimes people say, well, I want my app to connect to Bluetooth so that I can transfer data or listen to audio or whatever. There's a plugin that will let us do that. Because our web app by itself doesn't do that much. It just does what our, what our website can do. But now that it's become an actual app for Android or iPhone or whatever, these things have these capabilities. Cameras, Bluetooth, GPS, uh, all of that stuff. And we can access the features of the device usually through plugins. So. We're going to play a little bit with some of the plugins. For example, one of the coolest ones to do, of course, is the camera. How can I take a photo with my app? For our particular app, most likely, we're not really going to need that feature. Conceivably, why would a person want to take a photo with this kind of app? Um, not too much of a reason, but let's explore that. So in case you're going to make an app in the future that does take a photo, we will make it do other things, of course, like save stuff to a database, uh, vibrate, play sound, etc. We'll get to that. So here's what we'll do. Go ahead and open up your web browser. And we'll go over to the documentation. So whenever I talk about the documentation, I mean the Cordova documentation. In the website for that, you should, you should uh, memorize it as soon as possible, or if you can't, write it on your arm, because what you need to remember to go is to Cordova, apache.org go ahead and go to cordova.apache.org we've been here before but now we'll look at more detail cordova.apache.org they recently renovated the website a bit I've noticed I've been looking at the site for years and I've seen it evolving and I've seen how this project has gone from uh, you know very rough beta software to much more powerful full-featured software that is used by many companies. So you want to go to cordova.apache.org. Cordova with a V as in Victor, not Cordova like the city. Cordova.apache.org and go over to documentation. So either click the blue button or the top bar, documentation. And this is what I've noticed that has changed, which I like it a little better because it's more direct. 
all the chapters are available for us to jump to easily here. They used to be sort of like in subcategories. You had to poke around there a little bit more. But now what you want to do under documentation, table of contents on the left at the bottom, I like that it breaks it out like this. Every plugin here is now easily accessible. It used to be you went to the plugin screen and then chose a plugin. Here you can go directly. And these are the official plugins that will let our app access various features of our device, of any device. There are many other plugins not listed here, such as barcode scanner, uh, Bluetooth access, etc. There are many that are not listed here that we can get elsewhere. We'll see where. There are many others because this is an open source project. This is a project that people contribute to the world over. Someone creates, has a great idea. They submit a brand new plugin. People can upvote it, downvote it, improve upon it. Um, hopefully, someone creates something useful for you. But at the moment, we've got all the plugins. We have the ability to use all the plugins in our app. We did Taco, Plugin, Add, and we added 19 plugins. So we've got all the plugins available for us. There's the in app browser. Uh, save stuff to the file system, splash screen, etc. Vibration. We'll do camera in a moment because that one's a little more complex, but let's play with this one here first. Uh, I want to see how can I make my app vibrate. Let's say uh, it's asking for user input, and it's asking for input in a very specific way. No uppercase letters, no spaces, etc. And let's say the person does not pay attention and writes in a username with a bunch of special characters. They click Submit. I want them to know they made a mistake, so I want it to vibrate. I want it to buzz to get their attention that that was wrong. So I want to see how does vibration work. Go ahead and click on Vibration. It gives us a lot of detailed technical information and examples. This plugin aligns with the official specification, provides a way to vibrate the device. The plugin defines a global object navigator.vibrate. So again, this is all JavaScript. This is the beauty of it. We learn some JavaScript, it will automatically get translated to the, to the appropriate languages per platform. And then it mentions a little bit here. Example, this looks familiar. Document.eventListener or add event listener, device ready, on device ready, function on device ready. Basically, it's using the same sort of code that we've already got in our project that we will use over and over on every, every project, basically. How to install it, that's already done. Cordova plugin, add Cordova plugin vibration. It works on all the platforms, basically. Uh, Fire OS, Android, Blackberries, Firefox, iOS, and Windows devices. Uh, navigator.vibrate and navigator.notification.vibrate both work here. And then there's a couple here that don't work on all of the platforms. There's navigator.notification.vibrate with pattern. We can make a special vibration that it does like Morse code. Pss, 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 pss. We can make it vibrate with a pattern, but that only works on Android and Windows Phone. Notice it doesn't work on iOS. So you do have to be aware of some of this stuff that if you're creating an app that is universal for all of the platforms, make sure that you look at, well, this one doesn't work exactly the same on that platform, and this one might have quirks depending on your platform. So always read the documentation. I believe I mentioned it last semester, but we should all memorize the acronym RTFM. Anyone know what RTFM stands for? It stands for Read the Funky Manual. Read the Manual. Here's the manual, the documentation at Cordova. How does something work? We go to the manual. Examples. And so here then, okay, simple way to make this work. Navigator.vibrate plus a time, or navigator vibrate with an optional time in milliseconds. So when we want to make this vibrate, we have to think in milliseconds. 1,000 milliseconds is one second. And simply, we need to write the code navigator.vibrate and the time. Let's try that out. We'll make it more complex, of course, but let's just try that out here. This is JavaScript. So that means 
we need to go to our project folder. So on your flash drive, you should have a copy of the work, MySDCE. Go ahead and open the MySDCE project. The www folder. <coughs> and uh, this is JavaScript, so all of our JavaScript is going to be consolidated in the codeeker.external.js file. Let's edit that JS file, right click it, right click codeca.external.js, and we'll go to edit with Notepad. Edit with Notepad. This brings up our external codeca file. It already had some stuff built in from our temporary, custom, our temporary template file. And then we've got stuff that we wrote. Line 5 is what we saw at Cordova.apache. We need this event listener for a device ready. Once that's emitted, we launch on device ready function, which is right here. And as I said previously, 99% of the code we're going to write for this project or any project, taco based, should be inside the on device ready. So note that it's a function definition we're defining. OnDeviceReady is, <coughs> is not a reserved JavaScript command. It's not an official command. It was invented. It was invented because it needed to do these different things here. We made it do console.log. So to the console object, we're using the log method to print out a code that was ready. To the navigator object, specifically the splash screen sub-object, we have the high method. Remember, we have objects and methods. Uh, the method is basically the command. The command applied to this object, the navigator is the whole app, basically. Hide the splash screen once the device is ready. That's why your splash screen might last only one second instead of five seconds, because as soon as device is ready, <coughs> hide the splash screen. Uh, let's add a brand new line 10, so right after Right after line 9, your splash screen, hide, add a new line here. Based on the documentation, then simply, what we will try is navigator.vibrate. Open close parentheses, semicolon. So we're saying the navigator object, something about the app itself, we will do something with it. The method, we will vibrate. And we need to give there, we should give there a parameter of time in milliseconds, just to make sure it works. And we'll make it obvious, we'll put 5,000 milliseconds. This is going to vibrate for five whole seconds. We can do fractions, of course. If I wanted this to vibrate for one and a half seconds, what value would I put here? 1,500. 1,500 for one and a half seconds. If I wanted to vibrate this for, to vibrate for three, three and three quarters of a second, what would I put here? 3,750. Three and three quarters of a second. Milliseconds. So anyway, 5,000 milliseconds. Five seconds. That's, that's basically this plugin. It lets your app vibrate. How you use it We'll see in a moment, but let's let's check this out. Make sure you save your JavaScript file. I'm going to go back to my, you should have your command prompt open already if you set yourself up earlier today. And then we're going to go to your you're going to go into your project folder Taco run Android. Now this works best to test this feature. It will work best on a real device. A real device will vibrate. A virtual device will not vibrate your computer. So it might be anticlimactic if you do emulate Android. But for those of us that have a real device, let's check this out. Taco run Android.
each time you make any change to the code, it rebuilds, right? That's right. Um, the shortcut is when you do taco run Android or taco emulate Android, it automatically first does taco build Android. Mm -hmm. I have a question. We haven't got to it yet, but some of these um, that illustrations, the examples say um, bombs on device ready, and then when it renders, it's bombs. I don't understand what the bombs are. I believe that means about uh, default behavior to to negate the default behavior because sometimes something happens by default. Um, I have to look up exactly what that does. Short answer is it works, so we'll do it. Because the official documentation says to use false, so we'll follow along. There is definitely a reason why to put false there off the top of my head. I have to look it up. Going through the MySDN, MySDC, yeah. The fold, The fold. So this is why you want to do the setup for the first time, or else you'll be waiting for this to happen. You want, like I'm waiting here. I uh, need to set this up um, so that it goes faster the next time. But when you set yourself up the first time, it should go faster after that. You could. You could if you put in enough parameters. So I have a question of how you'd like us to be ready. So you'd like us to get to the point of having connected our device and got to talk about You unfortunately got here a little bit late, but I did say it several times. You did want to set up either a real device yes. or a virtual device, and that's it. You don't have to launch anything. You just have to make sure that your device is ready to go, and then together we set ourselves up to actually work with the project. Yeah. So I don't have to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, not really. Yes. All right, everyone. Let's. Uh, I know we're excited, but let's be quiet. Uh, a little quieter, please. So uh, mine's launching. And then um, mine, um, oops, I had mine on silent. That's why it didn't vibrate. But um, who got theirs to vibrate? A few people. Great. There you go. So if you've got a real device, you will, you will see that. Uh, oops, my code right here. So basically, as soon as the device is ready, it's going to, um, it's going to start to vibrate. There we go. You can't hear it from a distance. Oh, there you go. But uh, so I had it for five seconds, and it just did a very simple vibrate for five seconds. As I said, as soon as the device is ready, go ahead and vibrate. Now, that's not a very realistic way to make it vibrate, but this is just a proof of concept that I have the ability to make my app vibrate. Anyone need any help at this point? Did you hear something? Remember, it's not going to work if you've got a virtual device. The code is pretty straightforward at this point, but let's think about this. As I said, what if you wanted to uh, give some user feedback? Someone clicked a button to submit a username or to try to log in. Let's say we had a login screen to our app, and then they put in their wrong password. Well, a lot of uh, code would have to be set up first to accept the login and such. It would check correct password, incorrect password. If it was an incorrect password, that might be a reason why I might want it to vibrate. Let's say... Let's say this. Let's say that every time someone visits an external website, it vibrates. Just to give you a little feedback, you're in the app, you go to some other website, it vibrates for a moment. So this line here, I'm going to uh, cut it. Don't just delete it. Cut it. I want to move it elsewhere. Cut that line. And notice, if you recall, we have a function here, get URL. That's our function that causes any certain button press to open an external website. So I can add more commands 
to this get URL function. That's why a function is defined, so that it can do various things. So I'm going to move that line of code out of line 14, or wherever you had put it. I, I thought I said line 10. Wherever you put it, and uh, put it in uh, line 19 or so, which is right before the start of the in-app browser feature. Five seconds is way too long. We know five seconds works, but that's way too long. And we can deal with fractions. So let's say we're going to get a quarter of a second vibration, 250 milliseconds. Um, to see the results, I do have to save it, and I have to run it again. So notice what I did. I moved the vibrate feature over to this function that I've made before. This function is accessed whenever a button is clicked. Whenever a button that is marked with a class of BT and URL, whenever it's clicked, no matter which one it is, because we're using the this trick, whenever any button is clicked, it will then first vibrate and then open the external browser, the in-app browser. I want to save that. Remember the shortcut to bring back your last command, just press up on the keyboard. It should go faster. Subsequent times, mine last took nearly two minutes. Hopefully this time it'll be a little faster. <coughs> Here's the code so far. I just moved the navigator.vibrate method down to the function. In this case, I know that the previous 5,000 milliseconds worked. This is just for me to triple check my work. I could probably do OK if I save it and just go on to something else. But you have to decide if you want to check every time you make a change, does it work before moving on? That's a good idea to do, but obviously on mine. Sometimes I might skip it just because it takes a while on mine. I'm running so many apps that slow me down. Yours might run faster, so you can do so. two seconds. Okay, so eventually this will load up. My home screen is there. I've got the YouTube button. I'll click the YouTube button. You're not going to really hear it, but I tapped it and it vibrated for a quarter of a second. It went off to YouTube. I'm going to close that. Then I'll go over to my art screen where I also had latest classes. And then I uh, clicked on that one and it went to the college's website externally. So there it is. So that vibration should be working. OK, parlor tricks. But how could you think about how this would be useful? Like I said, what if you've got, you want to give users some feedback to, to say, hey, wrong password. Hey, you forgot to fill in this field. Some way to grab their attention, not just a visual feedback, a tactile feedback. So the documentation, standard vibrate, examples, not so bad, iOS quirks, time ignores the specified time and vibrates for a preset amount of time. So apparently on the iPhone, whatever amount of time you put in will be ignored and it will only be the built-in iOS amount of time. So I want it to vibrate for half a second, Five seconds, I guess it's got its own built-in time. On Windows and BlackBerry, the maximum is five seconds. And the minimum is one millisecond. So if you try to put in 8,000 milliseconds, eight seconds vibrate on BlackBerry or Windows, it'll get only go down to five seconds. Vibrate with a pattern. This one only works on Android and Windows. The way this works is you say navigator.vibrate. And then inside of square brackets, which is an array, which is multiple values at once, <laughs> vibrate one second, then one second, then three seconds, then one second, then five seconds. 
because it only works on Android <coughs> or uh, Windows Phone. Windows. Cancel vibration. For some reason, let's say you've got some vibration already playing and you want to cancel it. Um, I see this off happen often in games. People get really fancy with this and what they do is they make it that every time you shoot the little bad guy, it'll vibrate. Well, if you've got one of these games where you're going to shoot a lot, you're shooting a lot of little bad guys, it's going to be over and over and over, and then you're going to have these vibrations built on top of vibrations. So I suppose in that case, you might want to cancel the old vibration before the new vibration starts. But notice it's not supported in iOS. Deprecated. Does anyone know what that? It's not depreciated. Deprecated. Does anyone know what deprecated means? Obsolete. It may be removed at a future point. Don't bother with this anymore. So with any sort of code, not just Cordova, whenever you see anything that says deprecated, you should avoid it because eventually it's going to be phased out. And your app may be using old code that eventually doesn't do anything. At worst, makes your app unstable. <coughs> At best, it does nothing. So don't do it this way. This is the old way. Navigator.notification.vibrate. That's the old way. Don't do that. I don't know why it still gives examples, though. <laughs> and then with pattern, that's the old way and so forth. So this is our vibration plugin. Any questions on this so far? I have a question on build and passing. On what? Build and what is that? This, uh, these plugins, some are from the official Cordova team and some are from other people. People that develop the plugin in their, in their spare time, let's say. And because it's open source, everyone can contribute to this project. There are some plugins that are not passive, that are currently not really ready for prime time yet. They still need debugging. So the thing is that even a broken plugin may be available for you to use so that maybe you can help figure out how to fix it. Because since it's open source and collaborative, I can go in and roll up my sleeves and maybe figure out what went wrong and contribute a fix and to get that fix for everyone to be able to enjoy it. Let's look at over here. Uh, notice that when you open a particular chapter and it's got subchapters, that's nice. Let's look at um, let's explore this one a little bit. Dialogues. Click on dialogues. This plugin provides access to some native dialogue UI elements <coughs> via a global object. Okay, so what we're saying here, UI is user interface. Every device every operating system has a certain style. The style of pop-up windows by default on Android look different than the default style of pop-ups on iPhone, on Windows Phone, on Blackberry, etc. That's the native UI. We can create a dialogue, we can create designs however we want, but there are also built-in elements that we can access via dialogues, this is one of them. Um, this one works similar. Um, we saw vibrate, so it's going to be navigator.notification. And then we have a variety of ways that we can use this. Methods. So this is the object. Sometimes you have one main <coughs> object and then the actual method attached to it. Make the navigator do something. In this case, we've got the main whole app, and then like a sub-object, notifications, and then an actual method, do this. Do this on this object, on the app, basically. We have alert, confirm, <laughs> prompt, and beep. Let's look at beep first. Um, for some reason, I don't know why they don't do this, it would be nice if you click on this and it jumps you Take down to this section. <laughs> but I suppose you can also do it here on the left, right there. So scroll down to find the navigator.notification.beep. The device plays a beep sound. Okay, we can make this 
make so, give us some audio feedback. So instead of it just vibrating, or instead of it vibrating, when someone does something wrong, we can make it have you know a classic error kind of message. On our computers here, when we're trying to do something and it doesn't behave, notice it, it beeps at us. Every computer does. We can do the same thing on our app. Make the app beep at the person. Now notice, as we go through this, we can't exactly specify what noise or sound to use for people. It's the built-in sound that they currently have set themselves. So if someone had set the Macarena as their <laughs> beep sound, it will play the Macarena for them when you use this. If you wanted a specific sound to play, we have that ability on a different plugin. It's, uh, I believe it's the one, uh, probably media. I think media is the one that lets you play any sound. We'll look at that later, but I, want, I just want to try this one out. This is another pretty basic one. What it does is navigator dot notification dot beep, just like that, just like that. And what you do is you specify a time in whole numbers. Make this beep twice, 10 times, 40 times, once, whatever. And it works on all the platforms. Some quirks on Android. Plays the default notification ringtone specified under settings. So whatever the person set for their ringtone notification, that's what plays. Hmm. On Windows 7, it's a generic sound. On Tizen, it's another one. Doesn't say anything for iPhone, apparently. But anyway, I want to see how this one works. Um, what we'll do is just to test this out. Let's create... I don't want it to happen automatically. I want it to happen with, with some feedback. So. I want to create a button, just a simple button on the home screen. We've already got that YouTube button, but I want to create a simple button on the home screen so we can play with some of this stuff. Simple button, and when someone clicks the button, then it'll play the sound. So that will require that we create the button in HTML and that we then make the functionality in JavaScript. Let's go back to our project and let's open the index.html file. In the index.html file, we'll build a simple button. So right-click index, edit with notepad, plus, plus. And it looks like at about line 61 should be fine. Let's give yourself a new line 61. We've already got the about button there. We've got the YouTube button there. We're going to create a new button here. Um, Let's just call it beep. This will be the A tag, of course, looking at the previous code that we've done. This will be a link. Data role button. We don't need to get fancy at all. Don't worry about icon. You can put an icon if you want. I just want a button. Here's a button. Usually a button is linked to something. In our case, it's not linking to anything, but what I want to do uh, is add uh, a dummy placeholder link. So remember, we usually do a href to something. I'm not going to make that button go anywhere, really. I want it to behave like a button, so I'll put href, and then in the attribute there, we'll just put the pound sign. That's a dummy link. It doesn't go anywhere. It um, behaves like a button, but it doesn't do anything. And what I want to do here is write some JavaScript so that when I hit that button, something happens. And basically, we're always either going to use a class or an ID to accomplish that. The purpose of the class or the ID is to name our object in the HTML so that then via JavaScript we can reference it. The JavaScript won't know that we need that button unless it's named somehow with either a class or an ID. Just to see the other way of it, we will use an ID this time. We used a class before, we will use an ID this time. 
And remember the class or the ID, I like to add it at the end of the code. So make sure you're still in the A tag and we'll write ID equals quotes. We'll give this an ID which can be anything we want, but I like to name it like this BTN because this is a button. And um, maybe we'll call it BTN. Well, yes, but I also want to think ahead for other things, so I'll, I'll call this BTN uh, feedback. You can change this, of course, later. Notice how I spelled it, lowercase btn, uppercase f for feedback. That is optional. But for readability, this is much more readable than putting it all lowercase. Either way will work, capital B will work, any way will work. But uh, any way that you like to do this, go ahead and do it. If you learned in other classes to do it this way or whatever, fine. This is the way I'm teaching it in this class, and you can learn this or use any other way you'd like. Prefixing it, prefacing it, BTN with some name. Okay, let's save that HTML file. We've created a button. There's going to be a button on the home screen. And now we'll go over to our JavaScript to be able to access that button. And we have basically the knowledge already to do that on what we've written already. This sort of syntax we will use over and over. Something that lets us target an element, an object, in the HTML and run some function. So let's say after this chunk here, this chunk between 17 and 21, let's add a new line. Make sure you're still inside the curly brace of the whole on device ready function. Make sure you're not outside of that curly brace. It probably won't work if you're outside of it. And our syntax is dollar sign open close parentheses dot on open close parentheses. That is our most basic syntax. Something in the document will trigger something else. That's the most basic syntax, and that's what I've got back on line 17. The dollar symbol, remind me, what does that mean again? Money. Jquery. Jquery. Or money, sure. Jquery. It means jQuery. So, this is jQuery, which is equivalent to line 16, if you recall that. So inside the jQuery selector here, because we're selecting something within our document, in our HTML document, in quotes, what is the name of the thing we're selecting? BTN feedback, pound BTN feedback. The ID of something in the HTML called BTN feedback, the ID of it. We did a dot last time because those were classes. Now we're dealing with an ID, pound sign. Okay, what about that thing? Well, whenever we click it, so then in the on method, quotes, click. Whenever we click that button, comma, do something, and the syntax further is function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. That syntax will be used over and over and over and over and over. Sometimes we'll have here a class, sometimes an ID, sometimes even more complex than that. And usually we'll have some sort of click. Function and then, okay, what, what do we really want to do? And what we really want to do is inside of the curly braces there, and we're going to Um, say, uh, get feedback. We're saying, once we click on this button, run a function, which function? The get, the get feedback function. 
which is not a reserved JavaScript command. We're, we're going to invent it because get feedback will, in our case, we will make a pop-up, sure, but we will also make vibration, and we will also let it do the camera, and we will also let it do this and that. That's why we create functions, so we can do several things at once. That's the syntax that I've got up there. So then next line, we need to define function, get feedback. Notice I'm not doing it exactly the same way as I did the previous one. I'm not including the this object. In this case, I might not need it. This is the shorthand for basically the thing that I clicked on. The thing that I clicked on give me all of its properties, such as width and height and data URL and CSS and all of that. I might not need that at the moment, so I excluded it. But this is very powerful and very useful because it lets me do a lot of great advanced things. And at the moment, I might not need to be that advanced. This then eventually goes back to Navigator. Dot notification. Notification, notifications, notification. Dot beep. Open close parentheses, semicolon. Navigator dot notification. Dot beep. A whole number. We cannot do fractions of numbers here. We can't do half a beep. It has to be full numbers, whole numbers, integers. So we will say, just to make sure we hear it, three. Three beeps. When you click this button, make it bleep three times. Yes, all of that work, so that when we click a button, it beeps. But this is what we're going to see, that all of the things we take for granted, I click this and it does it. Dozens of lines of code. <laughs> I do this and that, hundreds of lines of code. Oh, this knew that I was at this college and I want to check in and say hi to my friends, thousands of lines of code. And, J and jQuery is, again, um, write less, do more. We're already doing that. Dollar symbol instead of document dot get element by ID, the element dot on click equals function. We're already, do we're already writing less and doing more. Dollar on. That doesn't do everything for us, unfortunately. There's still lots and lots of lines of code that we need to write most of the time, but this really helps us. Um, go ahead and save it and run it. This one will work on a virtual device. Let's try it out. Question? Yeah, why is the function there inside the underlying function like you could have experienced that for scope issues? Exactly. For scope issues. Um, that's a little more advanced than we'll get to at the moment, but basically if you create something inside of something, you can't access it if you're outside of that something. And so what we're doing is we're putting the get feedback inside of OnDeviceReady, which seems to be the best way to be able to access any of our code regardless of where we write our code. So in short, this is the recommended way to do it, and this is the way that works. The details of it are a long, complex dissertation on the theories of JavaScript, which we don't need to get quite into yet. So let's see if that works. Go ahead and run it. If you're doing emulate, if you're doing emulate, it might. Uh, if you're doing emulate, it might not. Uh, it might not play if your volume is off on your computer. Uh, if you do turn your volume up on your computer, remember to mute it again, please. There we go. Three times. It's working for some of us and other ones. There's the proof. This one will not beep automatically. There is a trigger that needs to happen first. Something needs to be clicked before this happens. Whereas if you just dropped in that navigator beep code, it'll beep as soon as the app loads without any trigger. Technically, there's a device-ready trigger. But here, the trigger is click a button, make it beep. It could be a button click. It could be when you submit something. It could be when something finishes downloading. You can get so advanced as in, let's say, when you connect your device to a Bluetooth device, make it beep. Let's say they can keep track of your of your speed, 
So let's say if you move your phone really fast for a moment, that would trigger the accelerometer, and then it would make it beep. So there's, some, there's always going to be usually some sort of trigger that makes something happen. It could be a click, it could be a, a download, it could be some sort of change. Okay, so I've got a button, a big old button on the home screen that says beep. So there we go, my tone is beeping. My tone is playing. Oh, what you need to do is click it and hold it and scroll up. That's okay, we are confirming that most people, we are hearing that. Yes. We can choose to answer this question. Suppose your uh, suppose your cell phone or mobile phone doesn't have a beep function. Okay, so maybe you could do a default that just doesn't do anything. But instead of beeping, then I want to uh, flash into work three times, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, and I don't want to ask, I don't want to know exactly what the make and model of the cell phone is. Is there a way to do that? There is always the ability to check if the device itself has any of these features. Right. We can always check. I think it always it often tells you at the very top here the most default thing to do. So yes, the short answer is that there is a way to do a couple of tests. Is this feature even available? We would require more code like let's say an if else statement. If this feature is not available, then do that. And then we can do else ifs, and we can do switches, and all of that. So there's there is way there are ways to uh, for fail safes and such if something isn't available to us. It requires more coding, but it's definitely available. Okay. Okay, everyone. I think we confirmed it works. So let's all now let's mute our devices. Let's mute our devices. We can confirm that it works. Okay, so what we've got here is we were uh, using navigator.beep. We made it beep. This navigator, uh, this notification object, lets us do more than one thing. It lets us also create dialog boxes. If you go back to the top of this page, <coughs> it was telling us that this will allow us to do beeps and also these other kinds of pop-up boxes. Let's explore those a bit. We've got alert, confirm, and prompt. Alert shows a custom alert or dialog box. Most Cordova impl implementations use a native dialog box for this feature. But some just use the simple alert, which is less customizable. So notice how the documentation is. It's always going to tell you the basic code. It's going to tell you this is what you need to write. Whenever there is some sort of parameter that is listed normally like that, that should be required. And whenever something is in brackets, that usually means optional. So if it doesn't have any brackets, that means you should add this option, this parameter, to your code. If something is in brackets, that usually means it's optional. You can add it, yes or no. It's up to you. So then it breaks it down to say, you do navigator.notification.alert and you feed it the parameter message. Message is a dialog message, a string. It's words. You put in words in there, technically a variable too, as we will see when we get more complex. We, we tell it to say something, a message. That's a string. We have some alerts callback. <coughs> alert callback callback to invoke when alert dialog is dismissed, which should be a function. So 
something will pop up with some message. We can have some title on the top of the box, which is optional. And then we can name the button. If we don't name the button, the button will simply say OK. But if we want to change it optionally, we can write great, whatever. So when someone clicks that OK button, it will then automatically want to launch the callback. A callback is any function that results from some other method or function. You clicked OK. Well, should anything more happen? Callback function. Anything more. We will see this a lot when we get to the database stuff because a lot of things could happen when we use the database. We add something to the database. So either there was a good result to that or a bad result. So we need to deal with those callbacks. What if we're trying to pull data out of the database? Again, we could have a failure or a positive result. We have callbacks to deal with those eventualities. This was programmed with one callback right here. Other ones, like when we get to the camera, have two callbacks. What happens if you properly take the photo? What happens if there's a failure in taking the photo? We then have to program those eventualities. The example goes on to say, navigator.notification alert. And they broke it up into multiple lines, which is just fine to do. You can keep it all on one long line, like the code here, or you can break it up, but you just have to be careful where, which I'll show where. But we say alert, we give it the string, which is the message, it will say you are the winner. It will then say game over at the top of the box, its title, comma, and then the button will say done instead of OK. When anyone clicks that done button, then it will launch the alert dismissed function. And alert dismissed is defined here, which doesn't do anything at the moment. That could make it do something else, such as update the high score. So that's how this works. Let's try that out. Right here, alert dismiss? Okay, very good point. Um, it's a function, as we've got up here. It's a, it's a function. It's going to run a function. But the syntax is that no, we don't put parentheses. We've been seeing functions over and over and over that have the, uh, the parentheses. And you would think, if this is a function, why don't I put the parentheses? Well, this is created in a way that we don't use the parentheses. It's just something you'll have to memorize. That's why, again, RTFM. Why isn't it working? I went back to the manual and I thought, oh, I'm putting in parentheses where I'm not supposed to put parentheses. Is it fair to say then that if the function doesn't have parentheses, then it's part of the program and it's already pre-programmed? No, we shouldn't assume that either. There's no such thing called alert dismissed. It was invented right here, function, other dismissed. We, we invented it at this moment. Unfortunately, we cannot assume because it doesn't have parentheses, it's a built-in function or you know, a default function. It's <coughs> just that when this was designed, it's setting it up without parentheses. I believe on a technical level, they don't use parentheses here because then it would be immediately invoked, meaning without even me clicking it, it would suddenly want to run the function. So, self-invoked. So immediately invoked. So here we don't uh, we don't want to run the, we don't want it to run until someone clicks the done button. So the syntax is no parentheses. Okay. And, the, and the callback is required. So if you don't really want to do anything, you just do the, just like that. Just like you did here. But you have to define the function to do that. Yes, because it is a required parameter according to the specification. You do, you should make some sort of dummy function there that doesn't do anything. Okay, so what I want to do, I want to do this. I want to copy and paste a little bit. I want to type, I want to do this, but I might misspell it. It's perfectly fine then to do a little copy and paste. Let's select that little chunk of code in the example. Copy that. What I want to do is I want to use that in my existing code. So copy that. We'll go back to your notepad. We're going to put it in the proper place in just a moment. Uh, but what I'm going to do is um, 
Let's give ourselves a new line 25. Let's paste this inside of the getFeedback function. Okay, so just to confirm here, I copy that example code. There's the example code. I paste it inside of my get feedback function. Just be careful where your feedback function ends. Remember, follow the lines that Notepad creates for you. Also, what I like to do is if you click on a parenthesis or curly bracket, it should highlight red if you're using the default color scheme. So it'll be very obvious. This highlighted and its pair highlighted right there. So be very careful about this because you can easily break things when you paste it in the wrong place. So make sure you've pasted the example code right here. I took all the code and I pasted it here, but it's not exactly how I want it to be. Um, I do want this navigator notification code here. What I want is that when someone clicks that feedback button, it vibrates, or not vibrates, but it, it beeps three times, which I'm going to cut that back down to one. Now that I know that I work, it maybe comment it. So it's going to notify first, and then it's going to alert, pop up. Then when someone clicks done, it'll want to run alert dismissed, which is defined right there. I actually don't want that function inside of the feedback function. Later on, when we talk more about scope and such, Basically, if you've got one function in the inside of another, one function in, in a certain function, it may not be accessible by other parts of your code. It's as if I put something in this bottle, and the only way for you to access it is to be in the bottle. <laughs> if you want to access it outside of the bottle, you have to define it outside of the bottle. This, that's the concept of scope in, in JavaScript and other programming languages. So in our case, you would only be able to use the alert dismiss function by any code we write inside of get feedback. I wouldn't be able to access get dismissed function anywhere else in my code. So I'm going to move it. The function alert dismiss, I'm going to move it from outside of get feedback from inside of feedback and move it outside, which I guess will be line 36 or so. It's still inside of the on device ready. That's OK. See, if I follow that parenthesis or curly brace back up, it's still on device ready. That's sort of like the special case. You do want everything, and then there's already these that are not there. Don't worry about that. Uh, but this alert dismissed now is outside of the scope of the get feedback. We can access this in multiple places. This can access it. If you write our own code for other things, we can access it too. Just cleaning up some empty spaces here and there. So now the same button will beep. And I'm just going to put one beep right there. Again, please remember to turn down the volume on your devices. We're done with that sound stuff at the moment. Um, it's going to beep first, and then it's going to give a pop up. We'll change the details of the pop up later. And then after that, we'll run Alert Dismiss, which does nothing. I'm going to run this on my virtual device this time so you can see something. Save your code. Remember, we've edited possibly the HTML and the JS, so you might want to get used to file save all. So everything is saved. If you haven't saved all your code, it might not work. And then in, in Taco, I will run Taco emulate Android, because I want to show you on my emulator. Or you can run it on your real device. Here's my code. Let's see if that works. Emulate. Oh, 
I'm surprised it didn't come back right away. So it's a little. Let me wait. Oh, I'm thinking it's slow. So let's see if that works. Okay, so on my virtual device, it launched it, and um, if I scroll up a little bit, I see the beep. Click on that. Game over. You are the winner. Done. Click on that. Nothing else further happens. That's all that I programmed so far. When you click the beep button, it will beep, and then it will pop up. You are the winner. Game over. Done. So if you want to custom, yes. So you could like set that up uh, with the database. So after the fill information in. At the moment, this one is only sort of like giving you information. We have another method that will let us capture information. That's the rest of the documentation here, where we have one called prompt. We'll look at this one right after the break. But prompt is the one that's going to ask for feedback. And then we can save that to a database. Well, but I'm saying for that one, that because you can put like um, the submission received mm -hmm. or something like that. Like, is it possible for that one? Oh, sure. Yeah, we can still use this this alert to give any form of feedback. Sure. Yes. In the HTML file, it looks like that line right there. Make sure you spelled your ID and such properly. All right, so if it worked this far, very good. Let's take our, our first break, uh, and then uh, we'll look at some of this other code here, and then do camera and all that other cool stuff. Question? What's that? Okay, I'll be there right in a moment.